Hi guys, welcome back to the second episode of the Wild Food Revolution. We're going to be finishing up obviously on the Strandfeld now as we move into a new ecosystem. Uh, but I wanted to take this time to you know, reflect and remember a wild food hero that we just recently lost. So Mark and Nico, this episode is for you my friend. So with all the seaweeds and the molasses, the important thing is to make sure that you get your permit from the post office. Um, just like I said before, with the sea urchins, they're not expensive. In seas, you can also get a crayfish one, you can actually go and get crayfish yourself. To show you guys today is an invasive mussel, it's called the Mediterranean mussel, and it's invasive along this coast from Saldana all the way to Port Elizabeth. The problem with this mussel along our shores has become an invasive species towards our black mussel, which is indigenous here. One of the interesting factors about the Mediterranean mussel is that you'll never find it on the subtidal zones, you'll only find it on the intertidal zones. And when this mussel is grown commercially on ropes, it thrives out there versus intertidal zone obviously growth rate, which is a very weird thing. You know, my assumption on that is because of the amount of algae within the water. Um, generally in the intertidal zone you'll find them growing amongst all the different types of seaweeds, um, giving them a good food supply. The muscle within itself is almost quadrangular, if you want to call it that. It's a lot fatter and bigger than our indigenous black muscle. By I mean it's quadrangular, it basically means it's almost got four sides. We've got one, two, three, and we've got a basic fourth side. Now with these muscles when they're little babies, they get a pretty big foot, uh, which allows them to place themselves when they are basically looking for the best place to net and set themselves obviously for their growth. Um, a very interesting thing about this. Uh, the legend has it that obviously how did these end up on our shores from Saldana all the way through Port Elizabeth is that apparently that these were attached to the bottom of the ships and that's why things like fouling are so important when new ships are coming into our country because they can bring in invasive species. So in 1950 this was discovered that this actually came across the shore. going out and foraging and looking for mussels, you know, go for the invasive species, leave the indigenous species to thrive and to keep on propagating and let's help them obviously clear up those spaces. These mussels get huge and the way that you basically harvest them, you notice they've got this little beard at the bottom and that basic beard is attached to the coral rock like that. A lot of things that people do wrong is that they take a spade or a shovel or a trowel and they pry them off the rocks like that which actually damages the rocks and the coral and the ecosystem around it. The best thing to do is to take your hand and put it inside and you just give it a twist once and twice and it'll pop off. Make sure that the water source is not stagnant, that you've got a constant filter of fresh water coming through, especially these ones in the intertidal zone, which are above the subtidal zone. So they've got to wait for the tide to rise, to push the water in to filter the water out. So that being said, just make sure that you've got a lot of seaweed growing, you've got a lot of kelp growing, you've got a lot of fish, you've got starfish, you know, you've got a good ecosystem. And if you find that out, just find a lot larger ones, there'll be a bigger piece of inside of these. Great, look at the splash. Everybody knows
knows about a red tide and not to pick mussels on a red tide. And the reason being that, especially the Mediterranean mussels, the baby Mediterranean mussels, um, they feed on a plankton called dinoflagellites. And dinoflagellites is actually very toxic to humans. During a bioluminous, you get a variety of different colors that come. You get the blue, you get green, you get oranges and yellows. You know, the dinoflagellites basically are the green and the orange and the yellow colors within that as well. So something very, very, very important to know. If you see a lot of that color, obviously, within the bioluminous as well, you know that there's a high dinoflagellite um, activity within that water. Therefore, that will be very toxic. A lot of people have a controversy about, obviously, eating um, shellfish over a uh, red tide. And the best thing is just to keep it safe. Harvest within your spring low tides, you know, harvest within good clean ecosystems. And harvest where there's abundance of muscle. If you see there's only a little bit of muscles, leave it and move on to the next spot. I get asked the question a lot of times, what is South Africa's indigenous sage? So let me introduce to you, this is South Africa's indigenous sage. It's called Africana Latia, which is also known as the brown sage or the brown starly. This plant within itself has a very high terpene profile, so the amount that you actually require when you're cooking is very, very minimal. You know, I did a beautiful signature dish where we actually used to pack this at the base and we used to put mussels on top and then stick it directly onto a fire with the smoke and the heat. The flavor that we got from those mussels was intense, but it was absolutely insane. One thing to notice about plants like this, especially with coastal and especially wild and indigenous to Southern Africa, is that they contain a high terpene profile and terpenes are very important from a medicinal side. The herb itself is a great herb to use for clarifying spaces, also for getting rid of insects, but also to make soaps. This herb also pairs beautifully with game, and also if you infuse it into honey, The herbs leaves also mix very well for a herbal tea. I'm down in the intertidal zone today. I wanted to look at a couple species of edible seaweeds. Um, the first one we're going to have a look at is the albicapensis, which is a sea lettuce. Everybody knows this is one that you can actually buy in all your retail stores. Before we start harvesting, I want to teach you a little bit about how to actually harvest them properly. So each of the plants is connected to a base, which is connected to the rock, it's a support structure. And if you look at each of these leaves, each of these leaves is called a frond. And what you want to do when you harvest it, you want to leave a small section of the front to the base so that you don't take the entire leaf. Very important is to do it by hand so you can actually feel the structure of the plant so that you know that you're actually harvesting it properly. So here with the, the other capensis, I'm going to be taking my hands in there. I'm going to look at where the fronds end. From the base, with a sharp knife, I'm going to cut it and remove it. What it's going to do is it's going to actually tell the plant now, hey, listen, I need to wake up now and shoot more shoots, and it's going to actually start propagating and actually growing more. So it's actually quite an important process of us actually cutting off pieces and actually foraging from it. Um, it just inspires propagation. Just like in nature, the fish would come and feed on it, bites it away, it will keep on growing just for the survival of it. Now this is South Africa's nori, it's called Papyria capensis. And it's so lovely. 
Um, if you look at this and the sea lettuce, they're basically very similar, but this is a little bit darker color. Um, almost got like red tinges to it. It's beautiful. But the thing with this, this is what they use to make the nori paper for sushi. What they do to make nori is they firstly they, they wash this into water, then it gets broken up into a pulp, and then it gets filtered through to screens and gets set to make like you do with paper. Um, then it gets low baked, low temperatures, and then dumped with moisture so it gets that pliability for when it wants to fold. So those that know where your nori comes from, how to make it, get down to the coast and start foraging. So this is what we're going to look at. This is called Gigatina polycarpa. And it's called tongue weed. I call it ox tongue because it resembles an ox tongue. Which is, so all these little nose, as you'll see, obviously with the ox tongue. This in itself is actually, it's quite delicious. Just one thing that with any seaweed, you know, they say majority of the seaweeds are edible. There are a few that are very toxic for you and that's also based on your body type as well. Um, but with it as well, if you feel it and it's tough, it means it's going to be tough to eat and then if it requires cooking. If it's soft and it breaks to the touch, obviously like we had with the, the sea lettuce, it's going to be very nice to eat and very palatable. Today I want to look at a specific red algae that grows along here and it's a red algae that's been used to produce agar agar. Uh, if those who don't know what agar agar, agar is actually a gelling agent used in foods for stabilizers, for gelling foods. I'm very versatile and you can actually set gels at room temperature with it. Those who are familiar with molecular gastronomy, it is the compound that they use to make the spheres, to make all those little caviars. Um, so it's good to know actually how to make it yourself. So, to find this red algae, one of the important things, it's, you will always find limpets growing out or limpet shells with it growing on top of it. And if you look right in front of me right now, I actually have two right in front of me here. So, this is what it looks like. So the name of this is called Chaladium pistoides, and it's a red algae that from Carmouth to Cape St. Francis is harvested by the locals on a spring low tide. Another thing about this species of red algae as well is that this has been harvested since the 1950s, so it's something that you know the locals have been harvesting for a very, very, very long time. So in this little pool here, I'm going to show you a settler's little favorite. And it's something that you know what it is once you touch it. And this is what they call a slippery orbit. As you can see, it can grow within an orbit, but it's very slippery. And if you have a soup or a sauce that requires thickening, in the old days, the settlers used to use this and boil this out, and use this as a thickening agent. Um, from a palate point of view, it's a very weird texture. Because like I said, with edibility of seaweed, entirely hard feels into what you can feel is actually palatable or not. It's important to rinse all seaweeds in some fresh water um, just to get rid of any algae or dirt or sand that's built up on top of the seaweed before you consume it. This is something I've really grown to fall in love with along the Australian coast within the Cape since I've been living here and that's the Cape Sour Fig which is also known as the Khunafe or the Sirfe. The plant has multiple uses that you can actually apply with it from the leaves to the flowers and obviously to the sap. 
leaves and stuff, because of their high mucus content, can be used for abrasions, sores, cuts, bee stings or burns. One of the importance with this plant within this ecosystem is a great soil stabilizer. You know, with it being around a plant in the shallow root system, it really holds the soil in place. Cape sulfur is very easy to identify amongst other species within the same um, genus and that it has the biggest yellow flower and it is quite a large flower. The fruit within itself is actually very delicious, you know, when you pick it at the different times. What I've noticed when picking this plant at the various stages while the fruit is ripening, um, it develops so many different flavors. So you can actually start playing with the different types of flavor profiles with this plant. You'll notice when these start becoming ripe, when the tops start going red and like a pale yellow color. I prefer these in two stages. This stage is obviously very delicious and the sap inside is so sticky it's one of those things that you really battle to get off and you get seeds everywhere. The way you consume it, you peel the skin off the sides like this. To reveal the center fruit. And with that fr center fruit is what you use and what you eat. It is super delicious, it is super sticky. Now the young kids what they do in season, especially this time, they'll go and pick a whole bunch of these and they'll get an old empty out coke can and they'll mash this up with a little bit of water and if they don't have water, if they're out and there's only by the sea, they'll put a bit of spit in it and they'll whip that up and that is called a polyvitskin. It is actually delicious and the nice thing about it, you can actually whip it to almost the consistency of a meringue and it gets very sticky. Then the next stage you've got to look at harvesting it is when it really dries out and this is what you'll generally find when you're going to a deli or to a store you'll find the dried version um, which generally you can rehydrate in water. This is a great plant to be used as a food source because it has so much diversity with it as well. You know, the sap is a great sugar supplement as well, super sweet, super sticky.